I think I'll get started. So good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here to session two in our 2020 ANU China Update Program. My name is Yi Xiao Zhou. I am Deputy Director of the China Economy Program at Crawford School of Public Policy, the Australian National University. Before I formally open today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to the elders of the non people past and present. Yesterday, in the first session of the ANU 2020 China Update, we heard from five leading experts about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Chinese economy and how China could contribute to the global recovery from the pandemic. Importantly, the first session has also briefed us about the near-term macroeconomic performance of the Chinese economy. Professor Li Gongsong was the host of yesterday's session, and he is with us today as well. So in this session, we will look at more long-term issues. The focus of our discussion will be on China's challenges in moving towards a high-income economy. According to the World Bank, in 2019, China's gross national income per capita is around 10,000 current international dollars and is currently an upper middle income economy. The threshold of the high income economy status is $12,535 and it is expected that China's per capita income level will reach this threshold and China will enter the ranks of high income economies by 2025, which is within the period of the next five year plan. Looking beyond the next five years, um, we know that recently the guideline on the 14th five-year plan for 2021 to 2025, as well as the more medium-term development vision of China uh, up to 2035 have been released. And it is proposed that China will become a medium developed economy by 2035, which is just 15 years from now, not a far time. Clearly, there are several major challenges faced by the Chinese economy in its journey to transition firstly to a high income economy status and then to a medium high income economy status. Will China be able to address these challenges through continuous reforms and policy adjustments? What are the key challenges or issues that need to be tackled to overcome these, issues, these problems? So here I lay out a few of the challenges to provide uh, some background for you. Uh, one caveat is that these do not exhaust the list of many challenges faced by China. Later on, our panel of speakers will link their presentations to some of these key challenges laid out here uh, by me. I will also introduce the panel of speakers uh, after I lay out these issues briefly. So first, China's aggregate productivity growth has been sluggish since after the GFC. Coincidentally, this has also been the case with other major uh, advanced economies and has been a feature of secular stagnation. Of course, the causes of the decline in TFP growth in China could be different from those in advanced economies. For example, one way to lift TFP growth in China could be to enhance competitive neutrality and balance out market forces with policy interventions in making investment decisions. Second, another possible cause of productivity growth slowdown in China is that the rate of technological progress slows when the room for technological catch-up shrinks as China moves closer towards the global technology frontier. Adding to this headwind is the recent escalation in technology competition between China and other technological, technologically advanced economies. So as technology diffusion opportunities wane, China will need to rely more on domestic innovation to sustain its technological progress. Third, population aging has been fast in China. This caused a slow decline in China's saving ratio from its peak of 50% in 2020, 2010 to 45% in 2019. Domestic financial markets have tightened and rates of domestic investment growth have declined. In this context, further open up China's financial system and an in increase in its integration with the global capital market could help support a resurgence of capital inflow to fund investment in China. But China has not yet had full capital account convertibility. Will this affect investors' confidence to allocate a greater share of their portfolio in, to China, given that yields of Chinese assets, such as government bonds, are higher? So fourth, income and wealth inequalities in China are still high. High income inequality constrains domestic demand because the marginal propensity to consume is lower for the richer. 
therefore other things equal, a more unequal society would have lower aggregate consumption demand. As external demand become more uncertain due to US-China trade tensions and the increased desire for more localized production in major export destinations, uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, China needs to bolster domestic demand to hedge against the risk that external demand loses further steam. In this context, alleviation of income inequality becomes not only important for social cohesion, but also for boosting aggregate consumption. Lastly, we can see that central government in China has been in surplus, budget surplus, but the surplus has seen no growth since 2017, and local government deficit has increased rapidly since 2007, and therefore overall government's deficit has been ex expanding since 2007. So what is the implication of, of continued expansion of local government debt and overall government uh, debt and deficit? So with these challenges in mind, I now hope to introduce today six panelists that I have the great honor and pleasure to host here. They are all leading experts in their respective fields of study. Uh, they have each contributed a chapter to this year's China Update book titled China Moving Towards a High Income Economy. Later, when the book is published online, uh, it will be available for free download at the ANU website, along with all other China Update series volumes over the past 20 years. Um, we also acknowledge the BHP for its support uh, with the publication of this book. Our first speaker is Professor Yu Shen, who is Associate Professor at the School of Advanced Agriculture and Sciences at Peking University. Today, his topic is China's agricultural trade new balance based on a comparative advantage. Our second speaker is Professor Xiong Chen, who is an assist Assistant Professor at UWA Business School. Today, he will discuss about tax enforcement and its implications for tax reform in China. Our third speaker is Professor Li Bo Ying, who is Professor of Finance at Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing. Today, she will talk about whether the offshore renminbi has become a safe haven at currency. Our fourth speaker is Professor Wang Wei, who is the General Director of the Institute of Market Economy and a Senior Research Fellow at the Development Research Center of the State Council of China, which is the principal policy analysis agency of China's central government. Professor Wang will present on China's urbanization in the new realm of technological revolution. Our fifth speaker is Professor Si Zhongsun, who is a social professor at College of Business, Law and Governance at James Cook University. Today, he will talk about innovations and their growth effects in China. Our final speaker is Mr. Joe Bowman. Joe currently is a PhD candidate at the Australia National University and has previously conducted research on the Chinese economy and financial markets at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Today, Joe will share with us his insights on the current conditions in China's corporate sector. So, we have got a very strong panel with specialties in various key areas. They will share with us their findings in their chapters, as well as their ideas that link back to the theme of this session. Each speaker will use 15 minutes to present, and please type your questions um, for the panel in the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, so after the presentations by the speakers, we will have about 20 minutes for the panel to address the questions. So if we uh, were unable to address all questions because of time limit, the panel will be happy to answer the remaining questions offline. So um, also, I just hope to remind that the event is being recorded. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. Without any further ado, I would like to turn it over to Professor Yu Shen for his presentation on China's agricultural trade. Thank you, Yixiao, for your introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone. I mean, today is a great honor for me to get the opportunity to share my view on uh, the imminent uh, platform for such a discussion. Now, under this year's theme, China's challenge in moving towards a high income economy. Today, my topic is about China's agriculture trade, new balance based on comparative advantage. And in the next 10 minutes also, I'm going to talk about three issues related to this topic. They are generally, I mean, number one, what happens in the trade, in particular, what challenges and opportunities are here? 
And second issue I'm going to talk about is about uh, now in the near future, in order to support, I mean, further economic growth, I mean, what may need I mean, for agriculture to be further developed. And the last but not least point is about uh, what's this implication, I mean, for agriculture trade for China. Now, to what extent it will reflect that comparative advantage. Now, particularly, I want to address a little bit, I mean, what this type of the change may mean for, I mean, the China, Australia, I mean, trade in agriculture. Of course, there are quite a lot of other issues uh, which will not be covered in this talk, but I'll leave you guys, I mean, to read the book, I mean, to uh, explore more details. Now, first, what happened in China and uh, what happened about agriculture development in the past 40 years? Now, China has made great success in agriculture and rural development over the past four decades. And before 1978 and 2020, I mean, China has achieved perennial I mean, agriculture's GDP growth. At the end of this period, you can see China is already using like 5% of global arable land and around 8% of I mean, fresh water throughout the whole world to feed more than like 20% of the global population. So under such a great achievement, you can also see the uh, uh, poverty reduction has, is going to be, I mean, a uh, 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 poverty reduction is going to be achieved, I mean, by the end of 2020. And at the same time, the agriculture industry also provide like, I mean, 280 million redundant labor, which is support the whole economy growth. Now, even we see this successfulness, I mean, there are still challenges there. I mean, as what I, you can see on the screen, this figure tells you that uh, along, I mean, the rapid agriculture growth, there is a phenomenon which is the net import of I mean, agriculture products has been increasing since 2000. This is reflecting to some extent more about increasing demand over I mean, the supply side and which impose great pressure on the country to provide I mean, more food. But this is not only constrained. Now, as you can also see that, I mean, nowadays China, I mean, uh, the, the, how to say the long-term economic growth as well as uh, the uh, uh, increased I mean, supply has already, I mean, put great pressure on the natural resources. Now, this cause how to uh, as well as I mean, the water, which I mean, put further constraint on the future supply of I mean, the food, uh, food, uh, food supply. In addition, you can also see as well as population growth will drive high demand, not only I mean, all food. These, all the three things I mean, put up together will, I mean, give a great challenge for the near future for agriculture development. Now, of course, trade is one of the important channel which will be used to, I mean, face such differences. But as you can see, the allocation of a trade, I mean, in particular in terms of the trade pattern, is too much focused on particular countries, which also, I mean. Uh, give a lot of uncertainties, in particular under the pandemic uh, type of uh, uh, the period. So this comes to the second issue, which is, I mean, what will be happening in the near future? Are this situation will be, I mean, released or not? Now, this figure, uh, this table actually gives you some projection uh, for the near future. I'll put in another word, in the next 15 years, with more rapid uh, economic growth, how the domestic food demand and supply will be, I mean, made. Now, as we can see in the near future or in the next 20, uh, 15 years, the China is going to experience, I mean, relatively, I mean, uh, supply. Now, according to CCAP model simulation, we can see the food security or, or self-sufficiency ratio will gradually decline from the current 98% down to 93%, which means additional 5% of the demand will be needed, I mean, met, I mean, through the international market. Now, such a type of increasing demand not only reflect in terms of a quantity, like we just now mentioned, but also in terms of the quality. As in particular, you can see that a 
A particular demand will increase more quickly than supply side, in particular for those high value product, such beef, such as, I mean, beef, lamb, their domestic, I mean, production, even they can increase, they will need to import more, I mean, feed, feed lots. And then the question here comes again, uh, what this thing, I mean, would uh, imply to us, I mean, for, uh, uh, for the rest of the world. Now, many concerns coming out to say that uh, whether increasing demand from China, I mean, food increase will jeopardize the world. My personal, world, uh, my personal view on this issue is more likely to say the, challenge, uh, the, the opportunity is better, is, is, uh, opportunity is much uh, higher than, than the challenges. Now, the reason, uh, there are three reasons I could put it, I mean, here. Uh, number one, we can see that throughout the whole world. I mean, there are around, I mean, uh, land, around two thirds of them actually hasn't been well, I mean, used. One of the reasons for them not being well explored is probably because it's lack of, I mean, economic incentive. So if China's demand actually can provide economic incentive for those countries to adopt the new technology and making more full use of these arable lands, the world food supply will be increased or even more than doubled. So in terms of that, actually you can see recently, now China has already, I mean, made great, I mean, uh, achievement, achievement, I mean, toward that direction. In particular, the One Belt and Road policy actually has already helped some of the developing countries to develop their new technology, as well as, as, as I mean, increasing the investment in those countries. So under such a type of situation, we will say that, I mean, comparative advantage would be a better way for China to reshaping its trade pat pattern in the future. Now, in the next 15 years, we are going to see that, I mean, China should, I mean, diversifying its agricultural trade. Now, in two ways. Number one is that, I mean, diversifying the product, I mean, I mean, by across country. Two more, two more implications actually we need to re-emphasize. Now, number one is that China is going to diversify its commodity as well as, I mean, by region. Now, this is partly because of two reasons. Number one, this will increase the welfare, I mean, throughout the whole world by, I mean, reduce the pressure for the international market. Number two, doing such a diversification actually will help domestic resources to be reallocated so that more efficiency use uh, of, the, uh, of the resources domestically would be achieved. Now, but in addition to that, we will say this diversification of the trade should also be focusing on another dimension. That is about differentiation of the uh, food products being quality. Now domestically, there are plenty of resources which could be saved and particular produced for the necessities while leaving the rest of high protein and high quality products to be imported. That would be one of them in the another good strategy. Now a good policy implication from such a type of, I mean, changing pattern would be saying that, I mean, along the way that China is going to diversifying its trade patterns throughout the world. Now, China will rely on more like a Sino Australia trade, in particular for the high, uh, high value type of products. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yushan. Uh, now let's move to Professor Shang Chen. When you, whenever you're ready, please ask. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Yisha and Li Gang, uh, for having me here and uh, on this uh, wonderful conference to share uh, my view on the challenges uh, to uh, Chinese uh, tax system. And uh, we're going to propose a, a tax reform to deal with the challenge. Okay, so we know uh, the road to the high income is not always uh, smooth. And now the uh, uh, from the perspective of the, the, of the physical capacity, uh, which is usually measured by the tax revenue as a share of GDP. So China actually, so this tax to GDP ratio has been declining over the past seven years. Okay, this is one of the biggest challenges that the Chinese government is facing. Uh, and we know state capacity 
Uh, so um, the tax capacity is one of the pillars of the tax capacity, uh, state capacity, and the state governance. And uh, as the tax GDP ratio is declining, so uh, there that leads to a lot of the problems, especially for the local governments. So here today, uh, I'm going to propose a tax revenue uh, revenue neutral reform. Uh, that means uh, we are going to focus on the tax enforcement to deal with the uh, challenge. So uh, by tax improving tax enforcement, I mean, okay, make this tax treatment across firms more equal. Okay, so when we talk about the inequality, usually we'll just think about the inequality between households and the consumers, actually. So there is a huge inequality in tax treatment across uh, firms in China. And uh, I'm going to show that this kind of inequality, in equal treatment, uh, on equal treatment across firms led to a um, huge amount of the misallocation, resource misallocation across firms. And then by improving the tax enforcement, that means by reducing the inequality in tax treatment across firms, then the government can actually uh, increase the uh, allocation efficiency, so can improve the aggregated uh, total effect of productivity, then expand the tax base. So if that happened, that means actually government can do both things, both cut the tax rate and uh, expand the tax base by improving the uh, uh, aggregate efficiency. Then that's the whole uh, underlying mechanism uh, of this uh, revenue uh, neutral reform. Okay, so today's talk is based on the uh, 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 a study uh, with my uh, co-author Yan Chaoxi uh, from uh, Yunnan University. Okay, so tax cut is a keynote uh, of uh, of China's government. Actually, not only China, maybe uh, around the world in many countries. So China's government faced the tax cut pressure both from the dom uh, domestic. Uh, and also internationally. So uh, we know that uh, in, uh, in 2016, uh, Professor uh, Li Weiguang, this is the first uh, picture, uh, this uh, is uh, Professor Li Weiguang. Um, so he claimed that China actually, so the tax burden of the Chinese firms uh, is too high for Chinese firms to survive. So he coined a term called the death tax rate in China. <laughs> And he claimed that the most firms in China actually facing the uh, the death tax rate. So of course it is a, li a little bit exaggerating, and the uh, the measurement of the tax rate he proposed is um, is not uh, very reliable. But I think it is a uh, stir up a lot of the discussions in China. And then his statement is also echoed by uh, another influential businessman, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cao Wang. So Mr. Cao De Wang is the chairman of the Fuyao uh, Glass. And uh, in, in year uh, 2016, he decided to make a huge investment, about $1 billion US dollar in the United States uh, to set up a very huge automobile glass factory. And uh, he explained his investment that, okay, he compared his investment in the factories uh, in China and the US, and he said the uh, uh, actually, the so U.S. Uh, the tax rate uh, in U.S. actually uh, thirty-five percent lower than that in China. Okay, so this also lead to a lot of discussion uh, in China. So Chinese government uh, that at that time faced a huge pressure of a uh, uh, cutting tax, and also at the same time uh, Donald Trump came into power uh, in two thousand seventeen, and he initiated the uh, uh, TJCA, that means the Tax Cut and the Job uh, Act. Uh, in that year, and also that uh, that act uh, was passed by Congress. So that means uh, China now faced both domestic and international pressure to cut the tax. And, and then actually that is just the, uh, some episodes uh, amid the long-term reform uh, in China. So if we look at the whole picture since uh, 2013, these graphs show how the estimated tax cut that had been made by the Chinese, Chinese government. 
just because of the tax reform and the tax cut in tax rate since uh, 2013. So it is a huge amount and it is increasing over time. <laughs> okay, so in, I'm oh, sorry. So in, in 2013, so it is uh, the tax cut mainly due to the uh, business tax to uh, VAT reform. So it's just the pilot reform initiated in uh, 2000, introduced in 2013, uh, uh, 12, and in 2013, just uh, uh, expanded uh, into 10 provinces and uh, including more uh, industries. And uh, that led to the uh, tax uh, cut. And then this business tax to uh, VAT reform moves on. And also the Chinese government just uh, uh, launched some uh, preferential treatment to the small firms. And small firms can enjoy the only pay half corporate income tax. And this leads to more tax cuts and then in 2016, the business to tax reform just uh, uh, came to an end, just uh, expanded to the whole world, uh, to, uh, to the whole chi uh, to whole China, and also include most of the uh, service sector. And then this preferential treatment to small business move on, and also include some on the expenditure. And in 2018, so the Chinese government cut the VAT tax rate standard value tax rate from 17 to uh, 16, and the next year. It is uh, the last year cut from 16 to 13. That leads to a huge amount of the uh, uh, tax cut, already uh, over uh, over billion. Okay, every year. Uh, so what happened to the long run trend of the tax GDP ratio? So this is 2013. We can say before 2013, actually, the tax GDP ratio was rising. Okay, and in 2013, it reached the peak. It's already very close to 19%. But after that, it's declining. Okay, last year just reached to uh, 16%. Okay, so there's a, okay, so the trend, a downward trend over the past uh, seven years. And this downward trend leads to uh, serious troubles, particularly to local governments in at least three aspects. The first is because of the uh, tax cut, the local government also need to cut the expenditure. So according to uh, one of my study with my co-authors, we found that the most vulnerable expenditure is on education. Okay, this is not good for human capital in the long run. And the second is the local government respond the tax decline by raising the informal fees on, on firms. That means now there's a displacement effect uh, of the formal fees uh, or a displacement fact of the uh, of the formal taxes with the informal fees, that is undermining the tax capacity. Okay, and the third one is uh, local government. We know face the huge amount of the debt, and it also weaken their capacity to pay off the debt. Okay, so now the question is. On, on the one hand, the local government has to face the tax cut pressure, both domestically and internationally. And other, on the other hand, they need to maintain the tax revenue to deal with some problems. And how to, okay, there is a tension between these two. Okay, tax cut and the tax revenue maintenance, how to reconcile the two. So here we just propose a reform, so mainly focus on the tax enforcement. Okay, this reform, the feasibility is based on uh, some basic facts in China's tax administration. Actually, China's tax administration is, uh, is a problem. So the, one of the biggest problems is it is quite discretionary. Even though the statutory tax rate is uniform across whole country, but actually see the, we have a lot of uh, variations across, across regions and across different ownership, and uh, uh, it could be different from different uh, firm size. So this 17% is a statutory. This graph just shows the distribution of the effective tax rate in each province, calculated based on the firm, uh, firm data. So the effective tax rate means a, a, a VAT actual tax payment divided by the value added, okay? So statutory rate is just a uh, uh, tax rate, just 17%, but most of the provinces is lower than that, <laughs> okay? And also there's a huge dispersion across uh, regions. So this graph shows two, two things. First, it's just the weak tax enforcement. 
because the most effective tax rate is just lower than the statutory tax rate. The second is just the unequal tax treatment. This is just because the firm specific tax, uh, um, uh, uh, tax treatment because of discretionary power and the tax evasion. Uh, and uh, this discretionary tax enforcement, sometimes it can be related to the productivity of the firm. Okay, this can be shown by this graph. This graph shows just how the firm specific tax rate okay, is correlated with its productivity. The horizontal axis is firm productivity and the vertical axis is the effective tax rate. We can show it is positively correlated. That means more productive firm face a high tax rate. So that means this tax, info, uh, tax administration actually is punishing the productive firms. That means the high tax rate make the more productive firms smaller, okay? And uh, the low tax rate on the uh, less productive firms bigger. And this leads to resource misallocation. Suppose that now we just make a, a equal tax treatment on all firms, then the productive firm could be bigger than the current uh, size, and uh, the less productive could be smaller than the current size. Then the whole productivity would increase, okay, from the whole pr uh, economic perspective. And then the, given the total capital stock and the to total labor force and uh, all the total uh, uh, production inputs, we can get more outputs because now the productive firms are bigger. Okay, so that's the rationale uh, behind the, this revenue tax reform. So what do we propose here? So the, our uh, uh, proposed revenue neutral tax reform rests upon this positive feedback loop. So we can start from better ta tax enforcement across firms, make them equal, uh, make the tax rate equal across all firms, and that means we can have a bigger tax base because we, now we have better resource allocation across firms. And then, then we can lower the tax rate to maintain the same revenue because now we have more tax rate. Low tax rate means lower the statutory tax rate. And with lower statutory tax rate, then the firm have less incentive to evade the tax. That means now the firm has better tax compliance. And if firm have better uh, tax compliance, the tax administration cost would be low and this could lead to better tax enforcement. Here you can see there is a positive feedback loop so that this tax uh, revenue, uh, revenue neutral reform could be in some sense, it is a self-enforcing because it is a positive, uh, it is a closed, a positive feedback loop. So what do we find here quantitatively? How much is the, uh, the, the Chinese government can cut the effect, uh, can cut the statutory tax uh, rate? So in terms of value added tax rate, so the vertical axis in this graph just statutory tax rate and the horizontal axis just the effective tax rate. The 45 degree line means the perfect tax enforcement where the effective tax rate is equal to the statutory tax rate, okay? But uh, okay, in 2007, okay, this is the starting year of our uh, data. So China is at that point. Okay, statutory tax rate is 17%, but the effective tax rate is only 11%. But that is just average. There's a huge dispersion across firms in the effective tax rate. And then by improving the tax uh, 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 enforcement, then we can move from A to D. Okay, this is, a, we call it the revenue neutral reform. And then in that case, the, uh, the government can improve the tax enforcement by raising the uh, effective average tax, uh, effective tax rate and reducing, cutting the statutory tax rate. And why maintaining the tax revenue? And how much the Chinese government can do just uh, according to our uh, uh, um, uh, identification, uh, estimation of the key parameters, that's a key part of the empirical work, we find it is a close to 13%, a little bit lower than 13%. Okay, that means uh, this is a low bound for the tax cut, the current one. That means, okay, with the current 13% uh, statutory tax rate, the Chinese government has some room to maintain the tax revenue unchanged. This can be done by improving the tax enforcement. Because in the ideal case, when the statute tax rate is equal to the effective tax rate, okay, the totally the revenue can be maintained. But of course, if it is a, a tax enforcement is still not as desirable as in point D, so the tax uh, government 
could still suffer some tax revenue loss due to the tax cut. Okay, so uh, the whole uh, this uh, um, proposed uh, revenue neutral reform actually not only can uh, enable the Chinese government to maintain the revenue, but also I think uh, can uh, um, be one part of the supply side reform of Chinese government. That means we can just improve the allocation efficiency and uh, uh, improve the market e efficiency uh, with better tax administration and uh, let the market signal work well uh, without a noisy tax uh, administration and a tax of enforcement. Okay, that's uh, all my uh, talk today and thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen, for the insightful analysis and very useful policy advice and suggestion. Yeah. Um, now let's move on to Professor Li Boying. Okay, thank you. Many thanks for uh, Australia National University and thank you very much for Dr. Zhou. Uh, it's my great honor to uh, be here to share my recent work. Uh, the topic is about the offshore uh, RMB. Um, it's the uh, offshore RMB a safe haven currency. Um, the China Financial Stability Report in 2019 pointed out that the factors affecting and threatening the global financial stability have not subsided at present and for a period of time in the future. Uh, especially uh, global multilateralism and the trade protectionist sentiments have intensified and the financial markets are highly uh, sensitive to the trade situation, which have led to the uncertainty around the world continue to rise and accumulate. So therefore, uh, system risk pre prevention and control under the global perspective uh, remains vital. Um, consequently, the analysis of uh, the demand for safe haven and the location of safe haven assets appears extremely urgent. Uh, traditionally, uh, safe haven currencies are mainly the Swiss francs, the Japanese yen, and the US dollar. And however, these safe haven uh, currencies do not exhibit safe haven characteristics at, at all times. And meanwhile, the large scale and uh, constrained demand for these assets is likely to lead to excessive high currency portfolio holding costs. So a highly topic, uh, a topical research question is whether RMB play the role of a safe, a safe haven currency. Um, after an important uh, reform of the exchange rate system, the RMB is, is striding towards more marketization. Uh, currently, the value of the RMB continues to be relatively stable, and various monetary policies implemented, by, uh, implemented and promoted by the central bank are relatively independent and prudent. The RMB has always maintained a stable position in the global uh, monetary system. Um, since the RMB has not yet been fully convertible into the capital account, the onshore market and the offshore market operates simultaneously. Um, compared to the onshore market, the offshore RMB market has a more flexible mechanism. Um, after years of painstaking management and development, the offshore RM, uh, RMB products have become more diversified. In addition, the continuous implement, uh, implementation of uh, financial innovation policies, such as uh, the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, and Bond Connect has promoted the continuous expansion of the breadth and the depth of the offshore RMB market. Um, whether the RMB, especially uh, the offshore RMB, has become a safe haven currency has triggered the sinking of financial markets, observers and uh, uh, participants. Some researchers deem that the net foreign exchange asset position and the side of the stock market a significant factors to measure whether a country's currency can become a safe haven currency. Currently, China holds the largest net foreign asset position of world, reaching uh, 3.2 uh, trillion US dollars, and its stock market is the second largest in the world. Uh, therefore, it's reasonable that the, the RMB is comprised uh, when considering uh, global safe haven currencies. Um, however, it's worth noticing that the scholars has, uh, have, haven't discussed much about whether it be the safe haven currency. The point needs a uh, further investigation. Uh, therefore, this raises uh, the academic question. Uh, does the RMB, especially the 
offshore RMB have the characters of uh, safe haven that is character characteristic behave uh, significantly different due to uh, different monetary environments. That is, are uh, there significant differences in the, in the safe haven characteristics of the RMB in different currency portfolios? Uh, meanwhile, there is attribute have heavy, uh, have, have time varying characteristics. Um, in the context of RMB utilization and the Bell Road Initiative, and then, uh, analyzing this issue uh, clearly assists us to explore the hidden effects of the RMB from a quantitative perspective and investigate the hidden value provided by the RMB to investors when extreme events occur, which in turn provides support for the RMB uh, internalization. It is also critical uh, reference value and uh, practical significance for the security of the financial system and the reform of the exchange rate system and the new normal. So starting from the extended uncovered interest parity, uh, we uh, select the bilateral exchange rates of the offshore RMB relative to main currencies and the currencies of countries along the belt and the road as a research projects. By observing the changes of the offshore RMB when global risks are rising and combining its differential performance in different currency environments to explore the safe haven characteristics of the RMB and simultaneously assess the temporary effects of the safe haven characteristic. And the answer is, to some extent, yes. So uh, we argue that. Um, the offshore RMB exhibits safe haven characteristics against some currencies among uh, main currencies and the currencies of countries along the Bell Road. It provides technical support and feasibility demonstration for promoting the development of RMB as a career for cross-border trade and payments and settlements in the countries along the Bell Road, and even as a denominated currency and reserve currency. Uh, to a certain extent, the exploration of the safe haven value is an important uh, manifestation of the offshore RMB market to perform its function, uh, which opens up uh, cognition and directions for uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent research RMB and its offshore markets. So based on the time varying uh, safe haven characteristics of the offshore mark RMB, Exploratory oriented enterprise can reasonably plan the asset allocation strategies, and financial regulatory authorities can also carry out appropriate policy coordination and institutional arrangements. Um, the asset pricing framework to uh, interpret the changes of the exchange rate is illustrated in the Turner paper. Uh, it first presents some uh, conceptual background and then introduces a recent advances in the, in the currency risk models as a later foundation for our empirical analysis. Um, and I don't want to spend more time here. I just uh, give some interesting findings. The first day we quantitatively analyze the safe haven characteristics of the offshore RMB in view of uh, augmenting the UIP regressions since potential currency risk factors can help to better understand its generate dynamics of the offshore RMB. Uh, the currency pricing model used, in, used uh, in a paper contains two risk factors. The, the first one is a currency specific risk factor and it is expressed by the average exchange rate, uh, rate change of the offshore RMB. The second risk factor is the VIX index. It's an effective measure of the global risk on a currency markets. And differences in the sensitivities of the risk and cross-sectional differences in foreign currency returns in large extent. There's the risk reporters to global factor should reflect the safe haven characteristic of a currency. Namely, a safe haven currency should have negative exposure to the global risk factor. And in, uh, in, in some way, uh, the, the, the offshore RMB holds safe haven characteristics, which exist in some main currencies and currencies along the belt, bring, uh, belt and road regions. Though it is relatively weaker for the safe haven uh, uh, characteristic of the offshore RMB underlying in, in currencies along the belt and road regions compared with some uh, main currencies. 
Um, secondly, considering that there may be structural breaks and uh, reforms of external race system during our sample periods, we adopt the rolling uh, window regressions to obtain a comprehensive analysis of the offshore iron base of heaven and its time bearing future. Uh, some observations are uh, remarkable. The first, comparing with the Swiss France and the Japanese Yen, uh, the time bearing from fluctuation in the offshore urban bill against the euro and the US dollar um, and uh, uh, the global risk factor are relatively weak. However, the time variation between extended rate changes and the global risk factor tend to be consistent with, in terms of the offshore urban bill against the Australia dollar, the Canadian dollar, and the New, and New Zealand dollar. Uh, besides, offshore RMB has more prominent safe haven characteristics than the Norway crown, the, Singa uh, the Singapore dollar, and uh, the South Africa rent. Considering the currencies along the belt and road, the safe haven characteristics of the offshore RMB relative to uh, Hungary uh, foreign, the Polish zolotti, the Russia ruble exist persistently. And for the heading effect for the offshore and be relative to the new Turkish lira and the Korean one, it's being strengthened and it becomes more outstanding in extreme situations. Um, in advanced process of the RMB utilization and the Belton Road Initiative, the RMB is becoming a safe haven currency is not the primary strategy objectives, but it's definitely a very important and meaningful uh, value tribute. On the one hand, it, it demonstrates that the gradual formation of the urban based international status and it guarantees the international community's re recognition of Chinese identity as a responsible major country. On the other hand, it can, it can promote the urban based nominated financial products to gain wider market recognition in global financial markets, especially with the global market exposed to uh, potential extreme risks. So for strengthening uh, of the arm based uh, safe haven characteristics, China needs to uh, get significant progress or improvement in some aspects. The first um, steadily advanced reform of the RMB exchange rate system to ensure that the flexibility of the RMB exchange rate better reflects market rules. The second is to uh, vigorously develop the offshore market and strengthen the financial innovation policies on a pilot basis. The third is um, to promote the internalization of RMB infrastructure uh, construction and make more useful attempts to support payments and a settlement system, accounting standards, and rating systems. The last one uh, is uh, stressing economic and trade relations with uh, countries along the Belt Road and consider placing the test ground for RMB utilization in uh, these countries. Okay, this is the end of my. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yin. Um, very useful analysis, revealing a lot of um, insights on uh, our offshore RMB developments. Um, now, uh, let's turn the stage to Pro Professor Wang Wei. Uh, hello. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to uh, share the presentation uh, of uh, our team. I'm coming from the uh, DRC, which is a, a top think tank in China. And our mission is to do the uh, long term comprehensive and strategic uh, issues involving in China's uh, social and economic uh, development. And urbanization um, is such a topic uh, on the uh, top of China uh, development. And uh, since last year, uh, our team have conduct a research project uh, concerning on the implication of new round technology on China's urban strategy. And uh, well, uh, if you look at the uh, Chinese uh, population scale, we had 1.4 billion uh, population and uh, the Chinese urbanization uh, is the largest largest scale uh, 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 urbanization in the world up to now. So Chinese urbanization is not the uh, is a very great 
uh, uh, development engine for China, as well also as for the whole economy uh, in the world. And uh, well, first I would like to have a quick review on the process and main achievement of China's urbanization. Well, uh, in the past 70 years, uh, China's urbanization uh, raised uh, uh, continuously. But for the first uh, uh, 30 years from 1949 to 1978, the increase is very slow, just from 10% to 17.9%. But after 1978, since we uh, uh, have the uh, reform and opening policy, China's urbanization increased uh, very rapidly, uh, and now it's already over 60%. And then the, the, another very important thing in China is the, uh, uh, how to say, the cities uh, allocates. Well, before 2010, the increase, uh, the numbers of the scale of the cities are expanding very fast. And then after 2010, uh, the cities uh, tend to concentrate and uh, there are more and more uh, city clusters uh, integrated gradually. And now in China, we already have 21 urban uh, agglomerations uh, in China. And uh, some, of, some of them are very big. For example, uh, for the Great Bay, that is a Pearl uh, River Delta and the Yangtze River Delta and the uh, Beijing surrounding surroundings and the Chengdu and uh, uh, Chongqing uh, uh, city cluster are the four on the top four uh, uh, big uh, city uh, uh, clusters. And in China, we already have more than uh, uh, 20,000 cities. Uh, among them, we have some big uh, cities uh, over the county uh, level. Uh, there are about 600, more than 670 uh, uh, big cities. But for the small city that we called Tong City, uh, there were about almost uh, 20,000 uh, cities uh, uh, scattered in 80% uh, of the cities are uh, uh, involved in the 21 uh, city clusters. And uh, while well, in the past 40 years, some of the Chinese uh, cities increased their capacities and influences in the world. For example, uh, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Beijing. Uh, we see the uh, first already uh, rank on the top uh, 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 in the global cities. And also, uh, within the progress of the urbanization, Chinese households have enjoyed more, a better and a better uh, living standard. For example, the living space uh, in 1978, uh, the average living space for each of the person in the city is just uh, 6.7 meter square meters. But now uh, we're already enjoying almost 40 uh, square meters for each of the person. Yeah. And then uh, we see in the uh, progress or Chinese uh, industry structure upgrading very quickly. Well, now China already, the service sector uh, industry already dominate or China's uh, uh, GDP uh, growth. And uh, since 2011, uh, the employment of service already uh, to be the top one uh, for China to absorb the, uh, employment or provide employment opportunity. And uh, uh, in 2013, the GDP ratio of service industry uh, passed on the manufacturing industry. And now it's already almost uh, 
45 percent uh, in 2019. Well, uh, looking forward, uh, uh, the next stage uh, of China's urbanization, as everybody know that uh, from next year on, China will open a new uh, development uh, stage targeted to high quality development and want to be a high income uh, country. And uh, if we look at the, uh, uh, the most important influence factor to our urbanization, the new round technology uh, revolution is a very important things, uh, uh, important factors. And uh, in, well, in the past 200 years, there were several rounds of technology uh, revolution. And the technology revolution will, pro will provide engines of urbanization because uh, it can provide new industry, new manufacturer, uh, uh, more and more employment and provide uh, new city infrastructure. But also uh, the urbanization, uh, uh, during the urbanization process, there will be a lot of uh, city disasters. Uh, for example, the transportation traffic, the pollution, and uh, uh, the mis uh, misuse of the land. So if the new technology can provide engine of the urbanization and also help people to uh, provide us new solution to, uh, to, uh, to uh, solve the city's disasters, that would be a very important thing and will accelerate the uh, uh, urbanization in China as well as for the other countries' urbanization. So when we are doing our research, well, we have look, look, looked into uh, inside uh, our urbanization uh, in recent year, we find that the new round of the technology revolution now provide a lot of uh, new uh, impetus and also provide China some of the new solutions uh, for our urbanization. The first one thing is that, uh, uh, well, the new round of technology revolution provide China uh, some, some of the new industries and the new business models and the new companies and even a lot of new employment in China. For example, the ICT industry, um, the e-commerce uh, platform, and uh, some of the new kinds of uh, uh, service for people's daily life. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, e-commerce can also help the people to order uh, the menu uh, from the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is a, a very clear, clear things in China. And maybe uh, because China has a very big domestic market, so this kind of a new technology can find more uh, application uh, versions in China. So uh, that is why uh, China now uh, turned to be the leading in the new technology uh, application uh, in the world. And then the second uh, important thing is that the te new technology revolution can provide uh, solutions to enjoy the green development. Uh, and uh, we think that, that there were several uh, mechanisms. For example, uh, the new technology can uh, help us to re reduce the carbon emissions, uh, for example, through uh, improve the transportation system to have new models of transportation, just like uh, DD or uh, two uh, Ubers uh, to sharing uh, 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 cars or bicycles or to use the electronic cars uh, to reduce the carbon emissions. And also the new technology can provide us the new, te uh, new uh, method to make the energy uh, use in efficiencies ways. 
uh, for example, the smart uh, 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 electronic network. So uh, the new technology can provide us a new driver to promote the sustainable and agree urban development. And also uh, the new technology can be a very good uh, solution to reduce uh, the, uh, the gap between uh, city and the rural uh, area, especially for China. Uh, for example, the e-commerce can help the farmers to selling their uh, agricultural goods to big markets, not just the lo lo local market. And also the e with the uh, internet platform, the farmers can uh, have more high quality supply for their uh, consumer goods and the products uh, uh, materials, for example, the fertilizer. And also they can take the uh, uh, technical training and the service from interna uh, internet platform. So they can help the uh, rural area to improve their living standard, to improve their uh, productivity of the agriculture uh, industry. And uh, well, the last things that the new technology uh, revolution can also help the government to improve the uh, city uh, governance, especially in this uh, 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 in, in these years uh, to uh, 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 during the uh, epidemic of civil ID. Well, a lot of city uh, government uh, use the internet uh, tours to help the uh, community management to help helping people to access to medical and education. So the uh, smart government now in China already a very popular uh, uh, thinking and uh, uh, application. Well, uh, just taking all this kind of uh, engine and a solution in our mind, the Chinese urbanization in the future, uh, we think, uh, maybe have a, a continuously uh, increase in the future. Uh, by 2000, uh, 2035, we think that the urbanization will be over 70%, uh, maybe 72 or 73%. Uh, well, because of the engine not uh, concluding the traditional industrialization, globalization, and uh, uh, reform and uh, opening policy, the new engine of the uh, 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 technology uh, revolution would be another very important engine. Uh, more importantly, because of the uh, growth of urbanization, uh, China will have some new character in our urbanization, especially in terms of innovation, high efficiency of the resources, and the green de development and inclusive development for the low, uh, lower income people and even for rural uh, 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 area. And the last things I would like to say, if we have benefit uh, from the uh, new technology uh, revolution to help us to promote the urbanization uh, in the future, China still uh, have to, uh, 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 to promote the in deep reform and uh, to have more policy to promote the industry upgrading and uh, to uh, promote the opening up uh, to the outside. Um, and uh, for the upgrading uh, industry, well, China would help the uh, traditional industry uh, to, uh, to make a great uh, application of the uh, new technology, especially the digital technology. 
and promote all of the industry to undergo the digital transformation. Uh, for example, for the uh, traditional uh, manufacturing and uh, some, some of the uh, service industry, uh, like the retailing, uh, like the uh, uh, restaurant, uh, and uh, the education and the medical uh, service. And uh, also, China would like to uh, have more uh, reform, uh, especially to improve our market uh, system. Well, you know, in China, we, uh, even though China have uh, uh, promoted the market system reform since 1978, but still uh, some area, the market system could not play uh, the important role, especially uh, in the uh, uh, factors allocation for the land, uh, for the labor resources, and even for some uh, physical uh, factors. Uh, fiscal, I mean, uh, financial or uh, uh, and some other kinds of uh, uh, factors. So the Chinese government would like to promote the in deeps reform to improve our market uh, system. And then China can uh, continues to benefit from our uh, reform uh, uh, benefit. The last thing is well, even though uh, chi uh, now the uh, the world uh, uh, environment is not so good uh, this year or maybe in the uh, uh, in the future, because there are a lot of uh, international trade conflicts, and maybe globalization will be have some backwards. But China would like to uh, to opening our doors. Uh, to the outside world, especially in the uh, service uh, uh, industry. Because in China now, uh, for example, more and more people uh, moving into the urbanized, uh, into the city, the uh, uh, service, uh, not only the production, productive, uh, product service, but also the uh, uh, consumer service uh, enjoying very rapid growth. So China would like to open our door to uh, welcome more and more uh, service providers to come to China to help our manufacturer to upgrade and to uh, promote our, to provide more and more better service to the city and also to agriculture, uh, uh, rural area. So opening up policy would it be uh, the more important things uh, for the high quality uh, urbanization. So that is uh, our initial findings uh, of our uh, uh, research product. And uh, we looking forward to the comments uh, from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wang Wei, for helping us understand better about how technologies, new technologies could um, not only uh, enhance China's urbanization, but also help China avoid some traditional problems uh, encountered in urbanization. Um, thank you. So let's now move on to Professor Sun Sizhong. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to have this opportunity uh, to share uh, with you my understanding of a particular aspect of Chinese economy uh, at China Update. Uh, the China Update has been uh, becomes a traditional venue for people to uh, communicate their understanding regarding Ch Chinese economy. So it's a honor for me. Uh, the topic for me uh, for this year's China Update is uh, innovation and the, the growth effects in China. Um, why should we work? care about innovations. Uh, so in the graph, I have a figure here, uh, the horizontal axis uh, is the patents application uh, from residents uh, in natural logarithm forms. And the vertical axis here is the GD GNR per capita. Uh, so, so, but the World Bank actually classified uh, high income economy by GNI per capita. And if an economy 
has a GNI protected guard higher than than like a little bit over ten thousand. Uh, $12,000, then it is classified as a high income economy. And we can see that China is actually uh, uh, getting quite close, as Yixiao said, uh, it's, it's, it's almost almost there. So, so certainly it will be interesting to see uh, will China eventually break these uh, middle income tracks. Uh, and doing so, Perhaps, perhaps it's a good idea to look at what happened to um, the advanced economy. Uh, so we, I have uh, graphs for Germany, Japan, and the USA. Um, we can see that the first observation is that, well, there's a, there's a, there's a positive correlation between these uh, patent applications, resident patent applications, and the GNI per capita. Um, and for this advanced economy, there seems, there, there seems to be a better innovators in the sense that the, 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 the blue lines, the slope of these blue lines is actually steeper than that of China, which says that um, uh, for 1% increase in the patent applications is associated with high percent increase in the GNF capital. So, so compared with this advanced economy, uh, the role of uh, innovation measured in terms of patent applications seems to be uh, modest. But anyway, it's positive. So, so hopefully, uh, these uh, innovations uh, will be a driving force uh, for China to break the middle income tracks. Actually, I have a failure with my colleagues so if, uh, if China breaks the middle income tracks, I'll win a beer. And I'm looking forward to receiving this beer very soon. Um, the second observation from this diagram is that actually China has a quality. So the, the innovation, for example, measured in terms of patent application is actually have a, a very high quality. It's higher than uh, the US, uh, Germany, and Japan. However, uh, I would say that the quality measure in terms of in terms of in, in terms of its association with the GNI per capita. It's actually weaker. All right, so 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 presumably or, or intuitively, uh, this um, uh, innovation should we expect to play uh, important roles in helping China to uh, sustain its growth and to break the middle income track. Um, the innovation currently, the in innovations in China has actually been uh, more or less in, on a growing uh, trend, on a growing trajectory, uh, measured in terms of uh, different uh, forms of uh, innovations. Uh, for innovations, they are, they are input perspective, for example, like R&D uh, expenditures, uh, R&D personnel. They are also output perspective, like patents. Uh, like uh, like uh, what uh, OECD classifies as four types of innovation, which is product innovation, producing new product, uh, uh, process innovation, new process, uh, marketing innovation, new ways of marketing, and uh, organizational innovation. So so so, so these different types of um, uh, innovations, uh, they are generally generally are on an increasing trend. Uh, on this slide, uh, it shows uh, the dis distribution of numbers of new product projects from 2011 to 2018. So it's, it's a dis distribution by industry. Uh, the, the red dot here is average average uh, number of uh, new product projects. And it's, it's, it's overall is a growing trend, low is not that uh, uh, obvious. And the blue bar here, the 
robot here is the mediums. So we can see that the medium is below the, the average, which is which suggests that uh, many uh, many industries they actually don't have uh, much uh, much uh, innovations, much or, or big number of uh, new product projects. But good signs that is growing. Okay, um, why should the innovation um, matters? Uh, Theoretically, the endogenous growth models would suggest that technology is the long run source of growth. And here, in, here the innovation will play a very important role. For example, our innovation might say if we put in R&D and uh, to improve productivity, which increase output uh, with, with the same level of inputs. And as Professor um, as Professor Wang uh, has just mentioned, uh, innovation could play a very important role in urbanization as well, so which I contribute to the long run uh, economic growth. So, so theoretically, we expect innovation to play a positive role. Uh, empirical is this the case? So I I look, I look at these uh, issues. Uh, uh, by using sort of both national level analysis and the industry level analysis. Uh, the analytical framework is an aggreg aggregate production function. So, so output is a function of input, uh, capital labor, and including the measurement of uh, uh, innovations. Um, for the national level analysis, uh, I use as what is called autoregressive distributed lag models. For the industry level analysis, uh, is a panel data uh, estimations uh, where I actually account for possible endogeneity of uh, the innovations. Um, the finding is that, well, the detail uh, I, I want to uh, present a detailed uh, findings here, uh, but it should be in the, in, the, in the book in the chapters. So, uh, in, in summary, the, the finding is that uh, um, there, there's a few short run positive effect from innovations. However, the long run effect uh, is uh, significant positive. And uh, this is both, this is, this is the same as in the industry level an analysis as well. Uh, for example, like uh, say a 1% increase in, uh, in the R&D expenditure roughly is associated with 0.37% uh, uh, output growth in the long run. Um, Given this, given this um, positive impacts, so so you may you may be wondering you may be wondering what should we do in the future. Well, well, certainly 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 we, we observe that innovation is uh, promoting growth. So, in, given this, incentive are just for us, and the Chinese government has, actually has been doing so. In, 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 the, in the past, for example, through promoting intellectual property rights protections and trying to offer incentives to the transformation of technological achievements into real product. So emphasizing that rather than say, okay, I'm a firm, I go to... I do an innovation, I apply for patent and that's it. Rather than doing so, they are trying to encourage to apply the patent. So, 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 so put into uh, the make the innovation works. Um, in addition, innovation by itself is a very uh, risky activity. So, so it actually justifies and, it, and it, it, it can generate positive externality. So to a certain extent, it justifies a certain uh, subsidy to uh, innovation. And in the past, China has been, well, well at least in the last, Last ten years, China has been doing, uh, I would think, uh, reasonably well in terms of innovation. Um, for example, uh, the railway sector, uh, the which is more or less driven by the, the government, or the internet industry, which is which is more driven by the private companies. Uh, it should be noted that this innovation actually many of them are new to the firms, new new to the com company not necessarily new to the industries and not even new to the human beings.
So in this sense, currently the innovation in, in China actually is not the quality, it's not uh, not not that high. Um, well, the last point I, I wish to uh, share with you is, um, or the, the last message of uh, my study here is that, um, well, there are policy there out there, well, on, the, on the paper. So, 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 so more importantly, it could be how to put policy, transfer the policy on the papers into action, how to enforce the policy. That would be, that would be, that would be uh, an important part in terms of making the innovation work. And that's all for from me. Thank you very much, Professor Sun Zhong, for letting us know your view about the uh, effect of innovation in driving China's uh, economic growth. Um, I'm sure in the chapter there will, there will be more interesting evidences that we can um, we can read uh, from your writing. That we um, now now let's move on to Joel Bowman. Okay. Good afternoon. I can you hear me, Zhao. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for this conference for pulling this all together and for inviting me to speak at this year's China Update. Um, now the views expressed in this presentation are my own and should not be attributed to the um, ANU or the Reserve Bank of Australia. So today I wanted to talk about conditions in China's corporate sector. Uh, now they're certainly important for China's own economic growth and financial stability. Uh, and given that they can also have significant implications for China's major trading partners, uh, including Australia. So the analysis of the activities and financial health of China's companies uh, is certainly helpful for forming assessments about the broader trajectory of the Chinese economy and the effectiveness of government uh, policies affecting businesses. So this graph here just shows within China's industrial sector, uh, the return on assets in the left-hand panel and the share of businesses reporting negative profits on the right-hand panel. So what you can see is that since around 2010 or so, profitability in China's corporate sector has been declining. So that downward trend reflects the fact that the returns to large capital outlays, that they've declined following the large boost to investment during the global financial crisis. We've also seen that the decline in profitability has been driven by private firms although they still remain relatively more profitable compared with state firms. We've also seen that profitability for state firms have increased uh, in 2016 and 2017, and that's following government efforts uh, to reduce overcapacity, leverage, and the general cost of doing business under the policy framework of supply side structural reform. However, over the past few years, profitability has moderated again. The share of businesses reporting negative profits has also surged this year. That's naturally reflecting the effect of COVID-19 and the imposition of restrictions on activity to contain its outbreak. The decline in profitability for the private sector appears to have been exacerbated by efforts by Chinese regulators to reduce risks in the financial system, where these efforts have resulted in a squeeze on the less regulated sources of credit, which private firms are typically more reliant on. The deterioration in profitability is also likely related to the broader slowdown in global manufacturing and trade, which is also concentrated among particularly private firms. We can kind of see elements of that through this graph here. So this just shows China's export growth on the left-hand panel and the composition of those exports by ownership on the right-hand panel. So you can see that since around 2010 and so, the growth in China's exports have been slowing. So the deteriorating profitability of private companies is partly related to these global developments. So there's obviously been a global slowdown in trades being underpinned by weaker growth in some advanced economies. And the US-China trade and technology dispute is likely to have also weighed on the corporate cash flows of some of the export oriented manufacturing firms. And you can see that private firms exposure or direct exposure to exports has increased quite materially um, over time, uh, whilst the, the direct exposures from state firms have been declining. So the slowdown in exports has likely weighed on employment in China's industrial sector, as the export oriented firms also tend to be more labor intensive. Having a look at leverage now, so this graph just shows amongst the listed companies, uh, the leverage, so a debt to equity measure. So it's split up by ownership on the left-hand panel and by industry on the right. 
So what you can see is that over recent years, corporate sector leverage has been, or leverage in the corporate sector has been declining. And we can see this in broader measure or macro, macro measures, such as the biz uh, measure of China's non-financial corporate debt, uh, that's been declining also. So the decline in leverage uh, has been driven by state firms in particular. So that's driven in part by the success of those supply side policies, which were reinforced by the introduction of deleveraging as a key performance metric for some of the centrally supervised state-owned enterprises. And we've also seen that funding conditions have tightened for some of the smaller sized firms, which are predominantly privately owned pre-COVID in response to the authorities' deleveraging campaign. So their campaign targeted shadow banking and smaller banks in China, both of which disproportionately lend to smaller sized firms. And we can see elements of that through this next graph here. So this just shows loan growth from the top panel. And on the, uh, the bottom panel, it shows loan demand by business size. Um, and that's, that's based on a survey based measure. So in response, we've seen that loans to the small sized firms have been growing at a slower pace compared with broader loan growth since 2018. Now, the cause of the comparatively slower growth of loans to these smaller sized firms appears to be supply driven, as survey measures of loan demand suggest that loan demand has increased for smaller sized firms since 2018. The tightening of financial conditions of smaller sized uh, private firms has also been exacerbated by developments in trade credit. So we've seen that state firms have uh, or it appears that state firms have tried to improve their own liquidity positions by delaying payments to private suppliers. And so this has resulted in a sharp rise in the average number of days before accounts receivable is collected by private firms. Now, the authorities have been responding to these recent trends. Uh, so the authorities have sought to ease the financial conditions, of these smaller sized firms over, over recent years. And, and this has particularly been the case this year. So as such, they're trying to increase the amount of credit flowing towards private enterprises. So they've done so by setting targets on the growth of smaller micro enterprise loans for large commercial banks. They're also encouraging that loan repayments for small and, and medium sized enterprises be extended as much as possible this year. The Central Bank in China, so the People's Bank of China, and they've also uh, provided a number of targeted reserve requirement ratio cuts reduced interest rates on some of its lending facilities, expanded its uh, re-lending facility as well. The fiscal authorities have also been involved. So uh, this year they're exempting some of the small sized businesses from needing to make contributions to various insurance schemes and, and reducing or canceling uh, various taxes for small scale taxpayers as well. Uh, and lastly, the authorities are also encouraging um, SOEs uh, to end their arrears to uh, private suppliers as well. Now, looking more longer term, the Chinese authorities have also announced a range of measures in recent years that, if successfully implemented, certainly help improve the efficiency of China's corporate sector. So there's three in particular that I wanted to draw your attention to. So the first is that the Chinese authorities have highlighted the need to, or the desire to promote the market-based allocation of factors of production, including land, labor, and capital. So essentially, these measures can help improve the extent to which efficient firms can readily access necessary factors of production that can enable them to expand their business operations. So on the land front, uh, the stated plans to reform the rural land expropriation system and land management mechanism. On the labor front, there's plans to reform the household registration system on the, on the capital front, there's plans to improve the issuance and delisting system, the stock market, accelerate the development of the bond market, as well as opening up the financial industry to international markets. The second key kind of policy I wanted to draw your attention to is a statement by senior Chinese officials highlighting the need for China to follow on the principle of competitive neutrality. So this is the idea that enterprises under all forms of ownership are treated on an equal footing. Now, the OECD has done a lot of work in this field, drawing on international lessons. And they've highlighted that a competitive neutrality framework should have some following elements. So essentially, there should be a clear delineation between state-owned enterprises, which are providing public services, versus those that are operating on more of a commercial footing. For those state-owned enterprises operating on a commercial footing, they should earn similar rates of return to comparable businesses. 
state-owned enterprises and private firms should also enjoy equal tax, supervision and government procurement treatment. And debt neutrality is an important area to address as well to ensure that there is a level playing field. So overall, the effective implementation of the competitive neutrality policies can help improve the degree which resources are efficiently allocated between the state and the private sector. The third key area that I wanted to highlight is that the authorities have also, um, also indicated as a desire to resolve zombie firms. So the State Council mandated the closure or reorganisation of zombie companies, which they define as firms operating in the overcapacity industry that have experienced three consecutive years of losses. So the government hopes to achieve this by improving the bankruptcy process, improving the, the financial support for, for mergers, and strictly forbidding financial subsidies being directed towards uh, these enterprises. So existing research suggests that the resolution of zombie companies uh, can help increase China's productivity growth, industrial output and employment growth as resources able to be allocated towards more efficient firms. Now in practice, many of these reforms may be difficult to implement and there is also uncertainty with regards to the extent to which efficiency will be prioritised. So overall, in conclusion, profitability in China's corporate sector has been trending lower alongside the moderation in economic momentum. In recent years, profitability has been weighed by tighter domestic regulation, the slowdown in global trade, and, and uh, this year, the imposition of domestic and international restrictions to contain COVID-19. For leverage, we've seen that efforts by authorities to reduce risks in the financial system have been successful, at reducing leverage in China's corporate sector. And looking more longer term, the efficiency of China's corporate sector can be supported by the effective implementation of a number of announced government measures including the liberalization of factor markets, expanding on the competitive neutrality policies and resolving zombie companies. So I'll end that there and hand that back to you, Yu Zhao. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, uh, for your thorough analysis of various aspects of China's corporate sector. It helps us understand the challenges faced by uh, Chinese corporations um, in terms of the future reforms required to boost productivity. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we now have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, um, if, if I may, uh, may I please uh, ask all the panelists to unmute themselves. Um, so I'll now um, I'll go through the questions uh, we have collected at uh, the Q&A function and I'll um, uh, bring the questions to you, uh, to the uh, suitable um, panelists to answer. Now, um, as, you have, as, as the audience may have seen, uh, some of the questions have already be, been addressed by, by uh, our panelists. Um, Professor Li Bo Ying um, has uh, addressed uh, some questions raised by the audience, and also Professor Xiong Chen has uh, addressed in detail several questions. So um, now I will. Um, so because we have some open questions that haven't been addressed, I, I first would like to uh, perhaps invite. Um, uh, Professor Wang Wei, um, I do receive several questions for you, um, a lot of interest on your talk. Um, first, uh, the question is uh, that um, it, uh, it will be fascinating to uh, watch how China, uh, China completes its urbanization with such an impressive stock of new technology to draw on, um, to draw on versus Western countries when they moved above they are 60% urban share. So it's a comparison between what China uh, can, uh, the, the technology stock China can draw from uh, with what the Western countries uh, had when they were at their 60% line of urban share. So do you think that what China learns in its coming drive uh, of urbanization can be repurposed to relieve some of the negative issues that uh, the residents of unlivable cities elsewhere um, in the developing world are uh, would suffer from. So basically, can China's experience be shared with other developing countries? Uh, what, what, what can China's uh, experience offer for other developing countries' uh, urbanization? Um, uh, yeah. uh, thank you for the questions. And I, if I'm not wrong, but the question is, uh, want to me answer that what kind of uh, uh, learn from the other country to solve the problem, uh, for example, the city and livable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yes, we have done uh, some some of international uh, uh, study in our project and uh, to find some city rising and some some of the city uh, how to say going down and uh, and we also find uh, uh, doing the case study to find uh, for example America uh, and Europe and even the uh, um, Japan and the Korea how to deal with some of the city uh, disease uh, during uh, in their development at a different stage uh, how to solve such such a kind of a, a problem uh, for example for for well among the unlivable or uh, or among the city this is uh, maybe uh, transportation uh, is one of the biggest uh, uh, problem uh, for, for big city. And uh, it also to make the uh, unlivable uh, conditions for, for the uh, city households. And uh, well, traditionally, a, the develop, developed country, for example, American and some of the European country, to solve this problem by uh, using, for example, to have a good planning, to uh, in, uh, to uh, have more supply of transportation uh, uh, service. For example, the uh, the transportation line between big city and uh, uh, small city surrounding, uh, and uh, to have the have more uh, space of development and uh, uh, also have a good plan to, to make a good allocation of the, the inside the city and, uh, and the connectivity uh, with some other cities. And also, uh, 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 how to say, to use some other kinds of uh, uh, multi-models of transportation, mm -hmm. for example, not just a car, by bicycle, in, uh, improve the uh, to use of the bicycle uh, and the ground uh, in this way. But in China, we know this is a good way. But now in China, we also have some other kinds of a solution, especially with the internet. And uh, in some of our Chinese city, we use the uh, smart transportation system. For, for example, in Jinan, in Hangzhou, with the internet uh, uh, and uh, how to say uh, uh, the good uh, just like a Google map, map to help the police and the government, uh, uh, govern, uh, the, the manager to understand uh, what kind of uh, a bottleneck uh, in what place and uh, how to uh, guide, uh, guide the people to use the transportation uh, uh, ways or roads or different models. This is one thing. Another thing is China to promote the, uh, how to say, the sharing uh, system uh, in our city, a uh, sharing bicycle, sharing a uh, car, and to reduce the cost of buying and uh, to reduce the uh, transportation congestions. Mm -hmm. uh, congestions. So uh, we have different ways. Uh, maybe we, we, we learn something and that we have some innovation and with the new technology. Yeah, thank you, Professor Wang. So do you agree Another very, uh, yeah, yeah, please. Well, another very uh, good example is, uh, well, how to improve the government to provide good service to the citizens. Yeah, uh, traditionally Chinese government uh, with a lot of bureaucracy and doing things very slowly and then uh, without efficiency. But with the uh, internet, uh, we call that e-government, uh, e uh, city government, and uh, the, the, how to say, the citizens can do things very uh, quickly and get the public service from the government. Uh, for example, during uh, these years of uh, uh, academic, well, the Chinese government, a lot of city governments use the uh, internet uh, and uh, uh, how to say uh, uh, mob mobile uh, internet to help the people to dealing with the uh, government uh, to access the public service. Uh, we call that, they call them as 
Zhang Shang Ban, Wang Shang Ban, and Miao Ban. That is say, you can uh, quickly to access to the public service mm -hmm. to guide the licenses doing business or to guide the, uh, how do you say, uh, permissions for government to do something. So uh, the new technology help the government to improve their uh, capacity to provide public service and uh, improve their uh, uh, efficiency to dealing with the uh, uh, city matters. Yeah, that, that is the two case. Yeah, yeah thank you, Professor Wang. Um, maybe just uh, like a second question, uh, just brief answer. Um, uh, because you mentioned about that China would like to stay open and to attract more uh, investment. Uh, uh, there would be more opportunities because China would like to open its economy further. So the question is, uh, in your view, what are the potential sectors that China is expecting to attract more FDI? Uh, like you mentioned about service, so maybe you can share with us your view on what, what, which service sectors uh, you think China is expecting to attract more FDI or would, would need more FDI? Well, uh, well I, I think maybe uh, the the uh, opening priority are uh, on the uh, how to say the service industry. Mm. I mean, all the uh, category of the service now China want to move to uh, to open the world. Uh, well, uh, uh, you, you you can notice the uh, uh, President Xi's uh, recent uh, speech. Uh, at the uh, uh, how to say China import expo and the uh, uh, service uh, uh, trade uh, trade in service uh, 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 how to say uh, expo uh, and uh, well China the gov Chinese government would like to more open more on service sector uh, including uh, financial including uh, uh, the uh, how to say the business service and uh, including uh, education, medical, and healthcare. Uh, and uh, all of these kind of uh, uh, service uh, 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 can open more and more to the outside world. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's very helpful for us uh, to know about which sectors uh, are, are more promising and most promising for attracting FDI. Um, okay, so. Uh, now we, our panelists are very kind. They have typed a lot of uh, good answers in the Q&A function already. But uh, I still um, now would like to uh, probably uh, ask um, Professor uh, Sun, Sun Sujong to expand a bit about uh, your answer to um, Ming Chi's question. Uh, basically, um, Ming Chi was asking uh, that uh, China has been helping um, poor countries in uh, development of their economy, how would China also help these countries in developing an applications of knowledge and innovations, i.e. technology transfer? So what is the prospect of technology transfer from China to these developing countries? Uh, through what channels or through what ways, what would be the best way to do it? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Yixiao, and thanks, Minji, for the questions. Um, uh, Good questions. Um, well, for me, I, I, would, I, I would love to see there are more sort of uh, Chinese investment in the overseas, but then it becomes a political issue here. Uh, so generally, 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 we expect that FDI, foreign investments, we will generate positive impact to the domestic economies in terms of well, a, a, a technology, technology transfers or in terms of what well, direct transfers or in terms of spill or spill effect to other uh, host economies. Uh, despite that this, uh, this kind of uh, spill was may not occur, it really depends, it, it somewhat depends on the host economies, the firms absorb the capacities. But anyway, it's one channel, I would think that's, uh, that's one way. Um, issue, the issue I can see here, well, there are, there are Chinese investment overseas in the last few, in, 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 in the last few years, uh, the issue I, I'm seeing that this, this investment, they are not uh, driven by, well, they are more policy driven rather than driven by 
seeking a firm seeking for for profits in a sense. So 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 for this, uh, the incentive to transfer the technologies or they, they don't have they have a have a have an objective function other than seeking for good investments. So so that's the downside I'm seeing uh, regarding this Chinese investment overseas. But I also think this is still a good uh, a channels that uh, a, a Chinese uh, technology can sort of uh, help local uh, promote uh, local economies in the host country. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Sun. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, you may have seen uh, again uh, a lot of answers have been provided by panelists, but um, maybe that leaves with me uh, some chance to answer uh, with questions um, that haven't been raised in the Q and A function to the panelists. Uh, Li Bo, um, uh, Professor Ying Li Bo, I do have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit I'm curious because uh, we know that currently um, China's financial market is not integrated with, not entirely integrated with the uh, world uh, market. So, and then my question is, uh, if there is further integration of, if there's further financial integration um, between China and the world, do you think that will strengthen uh, the uh, safe haven assets role of renminbi or weaken it? Because uh, one way you could argue that it will strengthen it is because um, uh, then with more, uh, convertibility, investors will have more confidence to hold Chinese assets and therefore they will demand more of uh, like RMB, right? So that will strengthen the safe haven assets. Role. But on the other hand, you could also argue that uh, with more integration, now the uh, co-movement of the two markets, the China market and the world market will be stronger. And then from a hedging perspective, uh, would that actually weaken China's safe haven um, Currency, I mean, China, uh, you know, maybe safe, uh, safe haven assets. Role. So, um, what's your view on that? So, more integration would that strengthen or weaken China's um, um, these, uh, safe haven assets? Role? Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I think that this is a good question. Uh, uh, I think with a degree of the uh, concentration of uh, China and RMB with the world, um, I think the um, uh, only if the value of the RMB itself is, is stable and accept, accepted by other countries. Also, uh, um, if the if the value of the RMB is stable, keep stable and keep to the market best, I think the the safe haven captures will persist uh, there will, will persist stably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, especially for during some uh, extreme events, uh, during some extreme or or when the with the period of the highly uh, uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the safe haven effect behave better. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, now, I, uh, if I may, I also would like to ask uh, Sean a question. Um, so it's a bit broader. Uh, so you have a very good proposal about how to uh, reform uh, China's tax system. It's a, a, like a, um, it's a very good strategy because it uh, cuts the tax but uh, improved in compliance and then actually rate improves the, or, or enlarges the tax base. Uh, so two good things happen at the same time. So my question is, um, when tax is lowered, have you got any estimate or any uh, idea about how that could actually boost uh, productivity or boost, say, uh, uh, like investment by the firm? So, uh, so we know it's neutral tax neutral uh, reform, but in your presentation, maybe you have got more an analysis on how that actually boosts more economic activity or production by the firm. So would you, would you, would you be able to help us understand more a bit about, a bit more about that? Yes, I think uh, that technically uh, that is a very good question. So because in the end, so the whole research just based on uh, the, the the change of the tax rate uh, and the tax enforcement uh, that would affect the effective tax rate and the behavior response of the firms and uh, and the behavior response of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, quite complicated. Uh, how, uh, so here in research, actually, we simplified the analysis just to focus on several things, uh, and the results is based on that. 
so uh, we did uh, um, uh, identify the effect uh, uh, of this uh, tax enforcement on, on firms and their inf investment. Uh, but unfortunately, due to um, uh, the uh, firm data, so it is a, a still quite short run. So to get the convincing uh, identification, then it relies on the uh, some natural experiment uh, to get the exogenous variation. So, uh, so that is a trade-off between the uh, uh, a reliability of the identification and uh, the sample periods. So that means we cannot identify the long-run effect of the firm's response. Uh, in investment and the, uh, their uh, impact on their TFP. So what I'll really focus on here is just the aggregate TFP uh, to look at the cross uh, firms uh, resource reallocation. Uh, we did find some uh, uh, very significant results. In terms of the firm's TFP and firm's investment response, we do not find significant results. Yes. That's interesting, yeah. So maybe will, will longer data be helpful? Uh, yeah, that might, yeah, might be, yeah. So here is all this, uh, uh, this uh, actually we, admit, uh, we should make, admit that uh, the current uh, results we have still based on some short run uh, effect and folks mainly focus on the uh, misallocation rather than on the uh, firm That's TFP. Right. Yeah and uh, the uh, firm investment. But, so uh, theoretically speaking, so we should expect uh, when on average the tax rate uh, is going down, so the firm should respond positively yeah. by making more investment yeah. and improve the uh, TMP. So that means that could be even better. So that, that means, okay, if that happens, our estimation here actually just provide a lower bound. Yeah. So that means the tax cut can be even further. Yeah. If we take into account the positive effect on firm TFP and firm investment. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, so, Professor Wang, I, I, uh, there are questions for you from the audience, but I also have a question uh, that I'm quite curious about. Um, so, you point out that there's just huge potential for China to apply new technologies um, to uh, achieve uh, like rapid and high quality urbanization. I I'm wondering whether you can share with us some um, uh, ideas about how to um, mobilize resources or how to uh, finance these investments. So what's the model of financing uh, that the Chinese government is having in mind? Is it how to, how, to, how, uh, how to, because these new technologies, to apply them, it will require investment. Then how to deliver these uh, like technologies? Any uh, insights from you would be appreciated. Oh, yeah, thank you for the questions. And uh, now uh, for the government, uh, they have noticed that the new technology would be benefit uh, for China, the long-term uh, uh, GDP growth mm -hmm. and, and urbanization, and all, as, uh, as well as to the uh, uh, increasing the living standard of the uh, Chinese households. So uh, since uh, this year, China have a new kinds of uh, investment promotion on the new infrastructure, especially on the uh, new technology. For example, the uh, uh, digital uh, equipment uh, infrastructure and uh, how to say the elect uh, new electricity uh, 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 infrastructure uh, uh, and some other uh, kinds of uh, uh, new technology infrastructure. Uh, for example, for the digital uh, infrastructure, Chinese government to uh, promote the investment in 5G uh, to uh, investment to improve the uh, cloud uh, 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 reservation uh, 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 platform, and uh, to help uh, to help the uh, the platform to provide the uh, uh, technical tools to help the small and media uh, company to access uh, to the. Uh, uh, internet or digital platform. And uh, also government would like to uh, put some uh, investment, uh, how to say, uh, a promotion 
uh, for the uh, company, I mean, for the manufacturing and for the, the small and the medium service to buy the digital equipment uh, and use the, the digital uh, tours or some other uh, uh, things and give them uh, some investment uh, input uh, impetus. Uh, the, that is the uh, government's uh, policy. And uh, by this kind of uh, uh, investment policy, well, uh, it can benefit for the current uh, GDP growth, but for the long run, can help uh, uh, industry, especially the traditional industry, to catch up with the digital transformation. Uh, uh, for example, for, for some of the manufacturing, they now are uh, uh, enjoying the digital uh, transformation. They can uh, enjoy uh, to, uh, how to say, to have the uh, 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 smart uh, manufacturing and uh, to can tailor the manufacturing uh, 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 target to the uh, uh, consumer uh, markets. And for the service, they can uh, have more uh, uh, convenience and more access uh, to the cons uh, to consumers or to the uh, uh, urban and the rural uh, household, and even can compete with uh, uh, international market. As you know, that uh, the service now can uh, treat on the internet. Uh, not uh, with, without FDI in another country. So uh, access to internet will provide the Chinese uh, uh, service uh, more open and also uh, increase their competitiveness uh, in the uh, international market. Okay, thank you very much for your insights, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wang. Um, so the time for getting together is always too short. Uh, we would really love to have, uh, have you here for, for longer, but we are just constrained by time. Um, so, so we have to call it an end now, but uh, China Update 2021 will, will still go on. So we will get back, to get back, back together next year uh, uh, at the China Update event. And we will also keep you posted about the publication of the China Update 2020 uh, book uh, through the ANU Press. So thank you very much again for your interest and for uh, joining us. And we, uh, well, we look forward to meeting you again next year. Mm. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.